Hey, welcome to the podcast, Game Changers. This morning, today, I have mis- with me Mr. Daryl Guthrie. Uh, Daryl, uh, thank you so much for being here. Grateful for you to take some time out to talk to us about national security. One of the things that I am so concerned about is, and keeps me up at night, quite frankly, is how are we doing as a country protecting our citizens? And Mr. Guthrie, uh, you served in the military for a number of years. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you for all that you've done for our country and what you continue to do. So you're a retired U.S. Army Major General. And for those who may not be aware, that's a two-star general. Uh, You are now Senior Peace Fellow with the Public International Law and Policy Group. You are also an attorney and co-founder of the Advanced Dynamic Defense Directorate. I know I said that correctly that time. 83. A national security think tank and business incubator, which sounds really cool. I'm looking forward to learning more about that. Most importantly, though, Daryl, you are the proud father of four and grandfather of six. So your household is busy during holidays. And you are an avid fan of the Alabama Crimson Tide. And so I have to ask, what are your thoughts on the new coach and big shoes to fill with Nick Saban leaving? Yeah, so Jeff, hey, thanks for having me. And great first question. And <laughs> always best to go roll tide. Uh, I Even so though we're in Texas. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I think here's the thing. Nick Saban is, has just, I mean, his record speaks for itself. He's a great leader. If you listen to any of his little clips, the things he talks about are really about what allow you to motivate young people to excel. And and that's never easy. And he figured out how to do it the right way over a long period of time. In in different it, programs. I mean, he was at Alabama for a number of years. I honestly I can't remember how many, but he he traveled around. I remember when he was at Michigan State. Yep. You know, LSU. He went to the Miami Dolphins. Yep. Um, won a always had champ- success. Yeah, won a national championship at LSU. I mean, he just success everywhere. So yeah. he's gonna be really tough to replace. The new coach, he he ain't in uh, the Pac-12 anymore, and that'll be his. <laughs> I think his biggest challenge. Yeah, the for sure. Conference is changing, and the games every week are going to be tough. And well, uh, not for the what take takes place on the field; it's everything off the field as well. I mean, yeah. the the pressure to succeed in Tuscaloosa is you know the greatest of, of any program out there i mean unless if if they don't win well let's let's put it this way if they lose three or four games that will be a a disappointing season absolutely absolutely and on that schedule is easily three or four games to lose but he's been successful every place he's coached so he has a record of success whether it was at washington or uh, an fbs school before that I mean, it'll be interesting to see. I'm cheering for him, and I think everybody in Alabama is cheering for him. Yeah, well, we all want him to be successful. But the leash will be short. Yeah. No doubt about that. For sure, for sure. Well, I'm I'm anxious to have this conversation today. Just, you know, and again, uh, we've gotten to know each other over the last year or so, and I really appreciate the opportunity to get to know you more. And so grateful for what you've done for this country and for your service. And I know that you are one of the people that we need in that think tank to make sure that we are doing what we can to protect our citizens of this country. Because to me, that's, as I said, it, it does keep me up at night. I'm a little little concerned about our future and we'll get into that. So if you wouldn't mind though, if expand on your deployments and your, your time in the service and, and your different commands. Okay. So I joined uh, ROTC, got an ROTC scholarship uh, during the Reagan uh, buildup in the mid-80s. 
And so that was a different military at that time. And uh, I went on active duty as a field artillery officer, served. My first deployment was to the first Gulf War. And I worked with the second armored cavalry regiment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that war was pristine in so many ways. The opponent wasn't the greatest as it turned out. Mm -hmm. It was fought in a desert and so that was that was different but it it has foreshadowed how we've looked at defense for the last really uh, 30 plus years mm -hmm. left uh, active duty after nine and a half years and then served 28 years in the army reserve the last the last five of those were in full-time uh, assignments so command is kind of interesting in the army. You typically command only once at the captain level. And I did, I commanded a, mm -hmm. a field artillery battery in Germany. Uh, so that's about 120 people. Mm -hmm. uh, then I, uh, as an army reservist, I commanded a battalion in Phoenix, Arizona. I commanded a brigade in San Antonio, Texas that supported uh, Army South, which has coverage for Central and South America. And so we did a good bit of work with them supporting that mission. Uh, then I, I commanded a, uh, as a one star, I commanded a unit out in, uh, in Joint Base Lewis McCord uh, in the Seattle Tacoma area. And it okay. was a, it was a training organization and I'd never spent any time doing training, but it was all about training cadets in ROTC and even at West Point. That must have been quite an experience. Did you did yeah. you see a great uh, variation between the cadets, um, you know, no matter where or de depending on where the location you were? Like West yeah. Point, I would think that would be, you know, the most, uh, you know, ready to, the most advanced set of cadets would be at West Point, right? Well, I think... You know, West Point, to some degree, is a is almost an Ivy League school from an academic standpoint. Right, right. So, you, but you face the same thing, no matter where the cadet comes from. Uh, if it's the first time they've really been worn a uniform, and and it usually is, except mm -hmm. for a few that are prior service people as enlisted soldiers. It's the first time they've worn a uniform, first time they've put their gear on, first time they've held a weapon, first time they've shot a weapon in many cases, mm -hmm. uh, first time they've thrown a hand grenade. And, and all of those things are basic things that, uh, in my case, I got at basic training at Fort mm -hmm. Knox, Kentucky. But in, in essence, you do a lot of that uh, on the ROTC side, at, still at Fort Knox, mm -hmm. Kentucky. And at West Point, you do it uh, on out at Camp Buckner, which is just uh, right right next door to to West mm -hmm. Point. So you see the same sort of things. You know, you're you know, the military is different. It's just different. You're doing you're asked to do some different tasks, and then most of all, you're learning to be a leader. And you know, I was lucky. I Even as a cadet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's a challenge, and you got to let people. You gotta let people try and then mm -hmm. fail. It's the one time when you can let you can let cadets do that. You let them try and fail, and that's how you learn. And I remember I learned a lot as a cadet. I I probably always had been a little bit of a leader, but uh, playing football. But I you, would I would be hard to convince me that you are not always some type of a leader. I mean, you don't get to two-star general without just that being part of the, who you are. Well, even as a kid. <laughs> so I, so I'll tell you this, and this is, I would always, I'd talk to cadets and I really loved that job because I got to interact with young people that really had a passion to want to serve. And mm -hmm. when you see that, it makes you feel pretty good about our country because mm -hmm. you still see that in young, in young um, cadets, see it in young soldiers too. Mm -hmm. They want to mm -hmm. serve our country. 
but I tell that I always get the question, uh, what were you like as a lieutenant? And I usually would say, <laughs> I was I was really not very good. And and I was I find that hard to believe. Uh, I I I struggled. I struggled. Now your bosses may think you're doing okay and your bosses see something in you. And I think this is true in the corporate world as well. You always have people that get to the top. And what's one of the things they always say? They go, I don't know what they saw in me, mm -hmm. you know, and I went back and asked a couple of folks that I worked for on when I retired from the army to almost two years ago. And I said, Hey, what'd you see in me? And I said, Hey, you just leadership. Leadership is a very subjective thing sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is starting to get used to being comfortable in who you are. And that was one of the things that started to be a change for me. But as a lieutenant, I mean, I messed stuff up. You know, I, I remember one piece of advice I got from my platoon sergeant one day that I always carried, carried with me. I, it's time to leave out to go to a field exercise and you're measured on hitting what's called your start point within plus or minus a minute. Mm -hmm. And all my people were off their guns and they were over at the, at the food truck getting <laughs> their last bit of, you know, getting their breakfast that wasn't going to be an MRE. And, and I'm going <laughs> nuts, you know, I'm yelling and screaming and they're, they're, 200 yards away so they can't hear me but i'm yelling and screaming and my producer <laughs> just said he said hey sir if you just move they will follow and you know what i started to move and everybody they then started running from the food truck and jumping on their guns and and started following and i and i think maybe that's the essence of being a leader is sometimes you just have to move uh, well, so, I think those those strong and effective leaders, uh, they have that nonverbal, uh, so they don't they don't have to say anything, and people will follow them just because of their their movement, their their nonverbal actions. Yeah. And I would say for sure you you fall into that category because, you know, you are it, it's just your presence, you know, and uh, having <laughs> get, gotten to know you a bit over the last year or so. Uh, you do have that 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 leadership presence where, you know, when you you see you, when, you know, when somebody sees you, it's like, okay, well, this this guy is he's somebody, he's somebody, yeah, oh, and, and you are. <laughs> oh, so, so how did you how did you then get into law? What was it about uh, the law that was so um, you know inspirational for to you to to get a, a law degree? Well, uh, so let me finish the last question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. And then I'll, but I'll smoothly transition. Okay. Right into that, right into the answer. My last two commands in the army were as a two-star. And so I commanded what's called the United States Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command. Then at the time it was Fort Bragg, now Fort Liberty, North Carolina. Uh, that was the first really big organization I commanded. That was 12,000 people in 29 states. And I had someone deployed every every day of, of the year somewhere, uh, Africa, uh, Asia, uh, Central America, had somebody mm -hmm. deployed all the time. And in my last two years, I commanded an organization that I really was kind of unfamiliar with, but I commanded a readiness division and I was responsible for a 19 state region from Ohio to the Pacific Northwest, which was good for me because it made me test some things that actually being a lawyer really helped. Uh, okay. Because we had big contracts. Uh, we I owned a 250 plus facilities or the organization owned 250 plus facilities. And so you had things that came up that were of a real estate nature or whatever, that it just helped to understand the, what the discussions were about a lot of times. But I decided to be a lawyer. I, I always tell people, I think I even told you at breakfast one morning, there was a fellow that went to my church growing up. His name is Bill Noble. 
and he was the only lawyer in the little community we lived in outside of Birmingham. And he just had this presence about him. Mm -hmm. He was the mayor of the town. He was calm. He was cool. He was, he, he was always busy and working. Mm -hmm. And super level-headed, couldn't get flustered. Yeah. Yeah. Never saw him any other, any other way than just calm and cool. No emotion. Later went on to be a judge. He could still be a judge for that matter, but. I, what I would say is, is seeing an example of someone, and it just made me think about that. Now, academically, and at, in high school, I was I was a football player, <laughs> and mm-hmm. I wasn't. I really didn't pay attention to studies. But when I got into college, I, I started to enjoy uh, the idea of learning mm-hmm. and, and reading. I'd always been a reader, but now I started reading for purpose. And so when I finished my active duty time, I told my wife, I said, look, I want to go to law school. Now, I wish I'd have thought about it a little bit more because mm-hmm. there's a lot of different types of lawyers. But I actually ended up being the kind of lawyer that really paid off in the Army. I was a generalist. So I, okay. I did. I did uh, a bit of everything. I, yeah, I did. I worked at a at a district attorney's office doing uh, civil civil work actually mm-hmm. i was the i was the sheriff's attorney and handled things that came out of the jail uh, uh but that for, was interesting for employee disputes yeah and then i i did uh i worked for the public utility commission of texas for a few years as a as a policy guy on telecommunications policy then i went into private practice and i did i did uh, family law litigation for about five years hardest thing i've ever done because you're dealing with people at one of their most lowest points in life Uh, what a transition from military to being the attorney for a sheriff's office now you're dealing with families and all the, the potential dysfunction that can go with a family that is in trouble Wow, that is, I mean, to me, that seems like opposite ends of the spectrum. Well, it, you know, it kind of, it kind of was, but you, I mean, I, I look at that time is I learned a lot about people. Now I knew a lot about people from being in the army, but over time that really paid off because look, life's about people. It's about relationships mm. and interacting with with people we kind of lose sight of that i think sometimes always but that really paid off as i as i continued to progress in the army reserve this idea of understanding people i think paid off i i never will tell anyone i got stuff perfect but well, I if use... you can understand people that is a big step ahead i mean that that will help you in all aspects, because then you can begin to read a little bit of what their tendencies are and where and how they make decisions. Yeah. And that will help you significantly. Yeah. And as you, you know, as you progress up in the military, I mean, it, it used Cape at the civil affairs and psychological operations command. If I slip up and say use a K-POC, that's what I mean. <laughs> Cause that's what it's called in the army. I, I, I had, you know, I had, I had five one-star generals that reported to me. I had innumerable colonels that I had to evaluate their fitness, you know, and, mm-hmm. and if they were going to get promoted again. And some of them were because there were wow. five one-star positions to be promoted into. And, and so being able to understand people a little bit better. Then I did some bank, now back to the law, I did some uh, chapter 11 business reorganization work for debtors. I did that for uh, a handful of years and then just, and, and then working with, I, my, I was in a law firm up in Lubbock, Texas. So I certainly worked with farmers mm-hmm. uh, primarily uh, some couple of ranchers, but mostly farmers in that area worked on renewable energy. Uh, uh, Interesting. 
windmills and solar solar arrays that were going to go on their property. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's the middle of the the yeah. wind channel uh, in that area. Uh, and then I represented, there. and I still represent uh, Reese Technology Center, which is an old Air Force base that was closed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is now a little political subdivision on the outskirts of Lubbock, uh, and and there's some neat things that go on there to to this day, and so all of those things sort of come together. It's one of the things that um, one of the things actually America should feel pretty good about is the the reserve components, and that includes the National Guard and and either the Army, Navy, Air Force, mm -hmm. or Marine Reserve are really populated with people that are, and we call it in the army being twice the citizen. And so you bring this experience from your civilian job into the military, mm -hmm. which allows you to at times come up with creative solutions to problems. And, and I would tell you, you know, if you know somebody uh, out, out in your community, that's a, a reserve a member of the reserve or the national guard you know pay attention to those people because because they're giving up some time and and they're good at what they do absolutely i, I worked around some incredible people over 20 28 years in the army reserve just incredible people that i just shake my head a lot of times about why did how did i get to the two-star level uh but it's that's a good. You're very thing. humble. That's positive for America. Well, I, and and that's good to hear uh, because we need some we need some positive news to make us feel a little bit more secure and comfortable with at least I do for sure with the current state of affairs. A uh, good transition to the AD three. So this is something that you started, helped start, right? Yeah, helped. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And so tell us a little bit about that, because now we're going to talk about national security, of which I think you're the perfect person to speak to that. Yeah, I I had a uh, a friend that I met up in Lubbock, uh, who uh, he happens to be a lawyer uh, now as well, but he had flown, went to the Air Force Academy, flew F-16s, uh, flew combat missions in, in Iraq. Uh, and just a great American. Uh, so that's my partner, Jeff Mustin. Mm -hmm. and, and and then Jeff uh, had to medically retire from the Air Force because he hurt his neck. Mm. Uh, but he always had this passion for national security. And he so he, after his law degree, he's he's worked the last, I guess, 15 years now, uh, maybe even more than that, but 15 anyway. Uh, in the intelligence community doing doing various things mm -hmm. and and he sees i think a little bit about what i've seen for some time and that's that hey it wouldn't be bad if we got a little texas way of thinking about national security uh the the national Amen. you know <laughs> I, I mean the reality is is there are a lot of decisions that are made inside the beltway of, of dc and it doesn't mean that those are, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody there, and I, I've interacted with a lot of folks from from there over the years. My daughter-in-law works in, inside the Beltway now for RAND, uh, which is a think tank. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you're all in one area, there is a tendency to start to look at every problem or challenge the same way. And sure. so Jeff and I had talked- Based on the environment. Yeah, Jeff and I had talked for years about, hey, if we're, if once I'm out of the military, and once he's in a different, you know, in a different place in life, we were gonna, we were gonna do something together. We really wanted to work together, and then Jeff over time had met our third partner through the vet, the Veterans Entrepreneurship Program at Texas A and M. So Jose Quintana is the third partner, and Jose. So you've got Is Jeff it, Mustin and Jose Quintana's? Uh, Quint Quintana. Quintana. Yeah. And and so Jose has been incubating businesses in, in the College Station 
uh, Bryan College Station area runs runs what's called the Innovation Underground in Bryan, Texas. He's been doing that for 20 plus years. And he's been an entrepreneur himself. So this incubating businesses part of, of our mission, that's really where Jose has, has done it and done it successfully over time, uh, which means, hey, a lot of those businesses haven't made it. You know, every new startup, most of them probably aren't going to make it. Right. But if you can add, you know, maybe some uh, some gray hair, <laughs> some people that work through a problem or that understand some of the challenges that may come up along the way, hopefully we can add some success to that. Now we're a new we're a new business, so I'm believe me, I'm going through the same thing at the same time. This entrepreneurial journey is is interesting. Well, uh, yeah, to, it's, to it takes least. a different mindset for sure. You know, and and most don't succeed because most entrepreneurs don't take on that uh, risk taking, total perseverance, all in attitude. And yeah, that's what it takes. Yeah, and I, you know, the but the reason we're doing these two things together mm -hmm. is, and this is really kind of Jeff's vision is that if if you're gonna talk about how to think about national security different. You, you probably got to have your hand in trying to incubate businesses that might make a difference in national security. So there's a, there's a thought process to doing, uh, doing both, both those things early, earlier this week, we met with a, a, a young man and he was a young man. He's a PhD candidate at Texas A&M. He's 26 years old. He grew up mm -hmm. on a farm. He drove a truck got a commercial driver's license and drove a truck to make his way through undergraduate school at Texas A&M. Wow, now, good for him. And, yeah, and now he's working on uh, a project that could have, I think, could have significant impact on how we do logistics uh, in the Army and, and the Marine Corps. And he's already doing some work with the Marine Corps. And, and so being able to interact with someone like that, it also, it also tells you there are young people around this country that still, that still care about our national security. And, and we I, don't hear enough about those people. Right. You know, right. everything we hear is negative, bad, you know, we're, well, I shouldn't say to my opinion is not necessarily for the betterment of our national security, let me put it that uh -huh. way. That, in my opinion, so so and is based on your background, your experience, which is vast and and extensive. Uh, what would you? What grade would you give our country for keeping its citizens safe and secure? Well, I uh, and that's a that's not that's really a, a loaded question. No, yeah, it's not. Am I? You know, I don't it's know. Not, but it's not loaded. And I actually used to one of the things I've done at, at my organizations I've commanded before. I've actually given myself a grade. I mean, I've stood up and briefed people and said, "Okay, I'm going to give, I'm going to give you a grade, not on how you're doing, but how I'm doing." And so I've commonly done that. So I thought about this question, and I would, I would say, you know, it's a overall. I'd say it's a C. You know, I, I, that's a, and that's a great cop out. Right. Uh, but. Well, but, it's middle of the road. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. pro, it's higher. Well, I'll be honest with you. It's higher than what I thought you were going to give, uh, but and, it's uh, so I'm anxious to hear why I see, because, yeah. you know, to do just nobody citizen like me, it's like, I, I'm, I'm looking at maybe a D to D minus, but let's hear the yeah. C. Yeah, so I to me it's made up of a couple of components, okay? And so there's a couple of things. Are you safe from external threats in America today? And so the last significant attack was on was on 9/11 inside our country. Mm -hmm. And when I say significant, I mean, we're talking about things that are like at the level of a 
I'm not, yeah. I, I mean, as bad as a school shooting is, or as bad as a shooting in a Walmart is, those are horrible. But from a significant event, that hasn't happened since 9-11. Yeah, it that that so, shut down our you know yeah airports yeah. everything was closed for three days. Yep, and looking back, that's kind of like a pretty good record. But the reality is, is we have to think about the future. And yep. so while we've been relatively, we've been safe from significant events since nine eleven. We'll talk about the future here in a minute. There are some other things that that I probably wouldn't give us as high of a grade on. Uh, the, the recruiting crisis in the military right now is significant. So now I spoke, you know, I spoke about young people that care about their country in a positive light. And, and now we've got to, now we've got to put the, talk about the flip side of that is right now uh, the Army and the Navy and the Air Force are having significant challenges meeting their recruiting requirements. And So and while that, we have a number of young people who are um, feel strongly about protecting and serving, we don't have enough. Right. We, right. We're very, very short. Part have come far short of where we need to be uh, with having that level of um, interest from our young people. And I mean, we could talk about that at length as well, but yeah. um, that's that to me, that is not surprising that we're at a crisis level. And, and there's a lot, and, what, and Jeff, what I would say, and this is my opinion. Okay. It's not the army's opinion or department of defense's opinion. These are my thoughts. You know, in my view, too many times we just make excuses. Okay. Did COVID <laughs> have an impact? Yes. Did the vaccination mandate have an impact? Yes. Uh, is the health and fitness of young people, does it have an impact? Yes. Did we have enough recruiters or not have enough recruiters? Yes. Those are just excuses. You've got to, you, you've got to work the problem. I mean, I love Apollo 13, right? Everybody our age loves that movie. Mm -hmm. And it's when Dean, I think his name was Dean Krantz, says, work the problem. Work the problem. Mm -hmm. And, and you got to, and it, and sometimes it's really hard to work problems. You've got everybody giving you guidance and telling you yeah. this is what we think can you set up some committees no shortage experts. of suggestions yep but at the end of the day it's a it's it's about leadership it's about leaders saying we are going to work this problem and we can get to the other side of it but and part of that problem is is we've got to communicate a positive optimistic message about why it's important to serve our nation. And so that's a, that is a problem because at least in my time in the military, if you don't have the people, it's hard to train at the level you need to train at to be able to have the desired effects, which all add up to readiness. And, and yeah. so we, Without we're question. having a tough, we're having a tough time in that area uh, right now. And then if I, if I had to say there was a, or there's a third problem, there is this uh, malaise. So, yep, Afghanistan happened. And it was a, you know, I spent, I, I went to Afghanistan once. My second son, who's a major in the army, he went to Afghanistan twice. Uh, he was there not long before it all fell apart. Uh, and, and, and so I, you know, my heart is, is I've been there. I, I've yeah. been there. I've seen, I've seen it. Uh, I led, uh, operations 
uh, or the defense support to civil authorities for Operation Allies Welcome at Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. supporting the, the interagency response. And we had 13,000 Afghan uh, folks that came process through there. And, you know, and so Afghanistan, it, it wasn't good. And Ukraine isn't good right now. Right. But I, and I, I think I had some leaders along the way that impressed upon me that the greatness of America is in that we look forward. And the greatness in our army is, is we acknowledge, we acknowledge our past, but we live in the present and we look forward to the future when Plan it comes to solving problems. So right. in, in those areas, and then just, if you just go around the world, there's some spots that we really don't pay a lot of attention to that absolutely impact us. You know, we, we don't pay as much attention to Central Africa mm -hmm. uh, that as, as we should, in my opinion, uh, because there are some significant terrorist organizations that operate out of that area. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't pay enough attention to the impact of the cartels in Mexico or the impact of the gangs from Central America. Uh, and some from South America. And it doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean any of these, of the people writ large are bad people in countries from these areas, but there are bad actors that are able to flourish from these areas. And we've just like any, just like anywhere. How, yeah. How to pay some attention to that. Uh, and then there are the, you know, then there's still the big problems, but we've got to look, at least I'll continue to believe this. Uh, it, we're America, and we have to lead. Uh, the The world still follows our lead, but that's getting a little shakier each and every day. Yeah, so I was those, gonna, as soon as you yeah. said that, I was going to ask: Do you think that the world? still looks at the United States as a world leader. Yeah. No, I do. I do think they look at us. I think they look at us to lead. I I think uh, they, they look at us to create new ideas. I think there's a lot about us still being a leader nation but that's eroded somewhat the, the chinese have helped erode that by their belt and road initiative uh, i think most of the countries that get involved with the chinese belt and road initiative probably don't view it as well after a few years as they viewed it mm -hmm. uh, when they got into those deals but at the same time that erodes us being a, a a leader uh for the free world absolutely and, and yeah. we you know and i again i always kind of come back to this thing of, of you know what are we doing what actions are we taking in some ways or I, or not taking or or not taking i think we we may spend a little bit too much time talking about what should happen and and or be the case or whatever and maybe a little less on what are the actions that we're actually taking to make a positive effect uh i you know i yeah. this this i grew up and once i got in the army reserve i was a civil affairs officer and people would say well what's what's civil affairs and i go well it's kind of a it's kind of a good question but here's Here's what I would tell you. We can help. We help with rebuilding uh, everything from, you know, a, a, a well uh, to a government. Uh, mm -hmm. We are charged with understanding people. And 
in theory, influencing people to allow military operations to be conducted. And, and I think, you know, Americans can be, you know, for all the, you know, if you watch uh, a movie or TV show, you know, there's always some depiction of an ugly American. But sure. we're, also, we're also a country that, you know, has, has blunted tyranny uh, more than once. You know, we're a country that stood by people. We're uh, young people uh, who have a positive influence. You know, when you take a, a specialist and you put them in Afghanistan and they're working with uh, a an Afghan soldier of similar rank there's influence that's going on in that relationship. And I think Absolutely. that's our great, I think our great power actually is, is to influence. It's this thing of leading by example. If you show people how, how we should lead uh, or how things should be done correctly, or as a lot of people in the military will say, what right looks like, you can mm -hmm. have a very positive impact, whether it's on military operations or how a government acts or whatever. But the but you have to recognize there's a lot of bad people in this world. Yeah, for sure. And they, and they see the world differently. Uh, and it's you just got to recognize that. And, and just being good and giving edicts won't solve all the problems you have to have actions right and all those actions right. don't have to be by the way uh military kinetic military operations a, a lot of them can be businesses that do business right in a foreign country that can be uh you know a soldier who goes who goes downtown in Germany and behaves properly. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it can be a, a, a container ship that knows how to dock appropriately in a, in a really tough harbor in some part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can also be leading, you know, leading by, uh, not letting bad guys get away with with their actions. Yes, uh, and, exactly. <laughs> and but we have to do it responsibly, right? Because because we yes to that we, too. We're a superpower, yeah. so we we have to do that responsibly. That's all well, hard. I mean, it's just all hard. It, it is, and the world is more complicated today than it's ever been. Yep. And we have more uh, terrorist groups than probably we've ever had. And they're they seem to be gaining some some steam, if you will, over the last several years. But there are two things that that have happened to me anyway that are incredibly alarming. And the first was the pullout of a, in Afghanistan of Af from Afghanistan, and the way that all went down. And again, I'm just you know nobody Joe citizen over here. And everything I learn is is what I I talk to people, read, but there there was no, I'm hard pressed to find anything good about that situation, and how it went down, and how the, everything, the results from it, and how we left Afghanistan, and how we left people who looked to us to lead, and what did we do? We just left, and then we had our own soldiers left there and you know and there were 13 of them that died and it was horrible so we've got that that happened and the rest of the world sees that there's no way that they don't see that there's no way that they do not see what we did in afghanistan and and for anybody that says well that really i think we did that the right way i think that's what happened Again, I'm just nobody Joe Citizen, but to me, that's that's a pretty tough argument. 
And the other thing that's going on, and we see it every single day, especially here in Texas, is what's going down at the border. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is crazy. And I had a, a friend who's an elected official ask me a couple of weeks ago, hey, I'm going down to Eagle Pass. Do you want to come with me? Because I want to see what's, I want to see that for myself. And part of me was like, yeah, I want to see for myself too. But then my wife, you know, knocked me upside the head and said, are you crazy? Why do you want to go to Eagle Pass? There's, there's nothing that you're going to get accomplished down there. And she's, you know, probably right. I, di I didn't go. So, but what's happening down there, again, the rest of the world sees it. There's no way that they don't see what's going on. And I'm sorry, but everybody that's coming across the border is not just, you know, looking for a good job at Target to raise their family. That's just not, that's just not the case. You know, when I hear 40% of all children under 12 are being trafficked and all the fentanyl that's coming through and everything else. So those two things to me, is kind of lead me to the D to D minus gray that we talked about earlier and it scares me. It really, it, it, it keeps me up at night. So I don't know, help me out. I mean, help me feel a little bit more comfortable here because to me, it's like, are we, is what, what is some, are we on the road for something really bad to happen in this country? Or am I just like way out there and not thinking logically? No, you're not so so Jeff, you're not way out there. So you can tell I'm a little passionate about all this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that gets to this question of going forward. What what do we look like? Okay, and I I I I will say this, and this is again, this is a personal, it's a personal belief. I I I think we're suffering a little bit right now from not not being able to look at problems differently. Uh, so, uh, but let, let's sort of take those two issues up real quick. So Afghanistan, I think your description of how it's perceived is exactly right. I think, uh, the biggest thing was about the perception from, uh, someone who might be our ally or partner is that can we, can we trust you? Right. Now, the president of Afghanistan left. And, right. you know, so it was our prime minister. I forget what they, what they call the head guy, but left. And, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, it created a, a it immediately then created a void that the Taliban was immediately able to fill. Mm -hmm. But but ultimately, it looked as if that we uh, weren't there to support them over the long haul. We, we face something very similar right now uh, in the, the Ukraine debate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll tell you, I feel... I feel really, I feel strong about this one, that the the president and the leaders in Congress have got to get together and put politics aside and, and examine what this means for the long term. And yes. I'm tell you, yeah. So the people, the people that you hear talk about uh, the impact if Putin was to win in Ukraine, mm. I agree with them wholeheartedly. Mr. Putin is a is a bad, bad actor. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care about anyone but himself. He he. I think we wraps, see mm -hmm. he wraps it up and a lot of other things, but ultimately, he's a tyrant. And if you can't stand up to a tyrant, then uh, things naturally flow out of that that aren't good. We've we've stood up to him to this point. 
I look, I person, personal opinion, we owe a much greater explanation to the American people about why Ukraine is important. Uh, and that's, that's the president's job. I agree with that because there's too much confusion. People Congress don't know. Is, yeah, Congress's job is, it is, you know, part of that is to fund, uh, part of their job is to fund national security. And yeah. I, I just, my concern is, is that we said as long, initially, as long as it takes. Now, by the way, I don't think that's, a, that's a strategy. <laughs> that's my opinion. I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, then it became as long as we can. And it's like, you know, we're America. We could do either one of those things, but we've got to understand, we've got to understand why it's important. To me, it's important for two reasons. One is uh, leadership. If we're not, if we can't do what we say we're going to do, then people, other nations are going to increasingly stop following us. Our word has Correct. to matter. And our word has to matter not by who sits in the office of the president at any given time. Our word has to matter with continuity across time. And yeah. we've, we've got behavior. to get, yeah, we've got to get, we've got to get that fixed. Yeah, we got, we have to get an alignment. There's no and, question about that. Yeah, and fixed much, much sooner. I had a second point, but it's really the first point that matters. Yeah, no. Well, that matters most. Uh, the border is coloring everything that happens uh, in America. But to your point, you know, the estimates of how many people have crossed, I think the latest uh, uh, estimates put that number around 7 million uh, that we've documented. Uh, that uh, or that may also include yeah. those that we haven't documented. We got a ways and but overall we're probably looking at maybe eight ten million people so we're adding like the metropolitan city of houston plus mm -hmm. you know to this yep. country throughout and 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 if everybody coming through was looking for a better life and and just wanted to provide for their family and do the right thing. And I have, this is the melting pot, right? I mean, we want people from all over the world to come here and live the American dream. Problem is out of those eight to 10 million people, they're not all coming here to live the American dream. Yeah. And that's, and, and this is the, I mean, you have to remember on nine 11, 19, uh, people were responsible for killing almost 3,000 people. Yep. Uh, even if 99.999% of those that have crossed the border have crossed for legitimate reasons or are just looking for a better way of life, or maybe they truly are refugees and in, and in some cases, I think they they really, really are. Mm -hmm. yeah. The problem is the point zero zero one. Yeah, that's that's big enough <laughs> to to cause a significant event that could then truly change how America looks at its its place in the world, its freedom. And, and again, it always troubles me. And I, and I look, people work, there were a lot of people that worked for me over time. And I'm sure you could find some of them that would go, oh, well, hey, he didn't, he didn't always do it the way he's saying today, you know. But most of the time, my belief is, is, hey, whatever money you've got, that's what you got. So don't just ask for more money. 
Oh. Don't you've got resource you you gotta look at the resources you have and you can make an impact that makes the American people stop to stop feeling restless. And I think yeah. that's really what's starting to happen is there's a restlessness that has grown b- because well, some we, of us are getting really, really restless because we don't see the <laughs> you don't see the you know you don't see the controls. I can so look I, and I don't know by the way I don't know enough about the procedures that are followed at the border. But uh, well, I know the, no, no, few of us do. Yeah, I, right? I, yeah, I know. And I want to give all those people that are working on the border all the credit in the world because I can't imagine what their days are like. Yeah, I, I can't and, either. I know what my days were Kudos like. to them for everything that they're doing. Yeah, I, I do know what my days were like when I received 13,000 Afghans over a eight-day period. And then I know the things that we did to ensure that they were uh, vaccinated, vetted, uh, assisted in getting resettled. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that was done for about 100,000. So very, very small compared to millions. I felt very comfortable with what we did for for our Afghan partners that are evac- that they were referred to as evacuees. Yeah. But I felt extremely comfortable with what we were doing as a nation mm-hmm. to bring them into our country and and resettle them. And frankly, in my opinion, they should they should be given some sort of special status because they by and large fought along our fought alongside us uh yeah in their yeah. country but they assisted us along the way yeah they put their I, life I'm, on the line yeah i'm not certain what what's going on at the border and here's the thing it only takes a few and we know this we just know this from a, a few people that are motivated can can have a significant impact on our country. Yeah. And we now yes. have that fear that that's that that's going to happen. And the thing is it's about it's about actions. You know, like what actions can we take? And I'm not talking about what actions I mean I again I always go back to Apollo 13. Work, I always remember the scene that I like best isn't the one where the, you know, they figure out a way to clean the air mm-hmm. of of uh, carbon monoxide. It's when Dean Krantz says, puts an X and then draws the circle and puts an X on the earth and said, you got to get from here to there Mm -hmm. and you've only got what's they have with them. Right. And that's working the problem. I mean, that's, that's working the problem. It's like, yeah, part of being, part of being a leader, a senior leader in our government is, yep. You've got budget responsibilities. You've got a whole host of responsibilities. A lot of them are laid out in law, what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, But ultimately, you've got a whole bunch of people that are working for you that is that if you're leading them, you're supposed to be working the problem every day to see the best outcome come for America. Yeah. Uh, And... Right now, government is struggling. And then some of the decisions that may get made along the way by perhaps more junior people or mid-level people, you know, leave you scratching your head 
But at the end mm-hmm. of the day, you've got a certain amount of resources at any given point in time, and you're supposed to deliver a result. It's as simple yeah. as that. Yeah. And I want, I want, <laughs> I want to be sure to whatever extent we can be sure that we are con- constantly moving forward, as you've said before, to protect what we have and what we have our greatest the greatest part of this country is the people all of the people that are here and of course they're you know bad actors as you said but we have to protect our the citizens of this country and we have to make sure that the united states continues to be the leader in the world looked at as the leader that we're trusted that you know we're going to do the right thing as the United States. We're going to do the right thing. And I think a lot of people right now are thinking, are we going to do the right thing? I mean, are we, are we do, are we doing the right thing here? You know? <laughs> and, and I, and I yeah. want to be sure that we are, but I think, you know, you know, and I think that by and large, we have a lot of great people in charge. We have a lot of great people, but we also have some not so great people. And that's, I think that's what concerns many of us. So great discussion, Daryl Guthrie. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Give us a a little bit of a tease for the next episode, because you're going to come back and we're going to (laughs) talk leadership. And you are certainly one of those strong and effective leaders. And again, your presence alone tells people that you, you truly are a leader. So give us a little bit of a tease of what we're going to talk about next time as you talk about your uh, five points of leadership. Yeah, so I I probably like lots of lots of leaders, at least in the military. Uh, you, I always tell people, you, everybody's got a leadership philosophy. Whatever it may be, uh, write it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wrote mine down when I started to uh, command the End of my career, I commanded 13 of the final 15 years that I was in the uh, army. And so, uh, but I wrote it, I wrote these down at the start of that, but the five points are, you know, some of these may not ring true. And uh, actually, I think they do ring true in any, whether in government or corporate America or, or the army for that matter. But so first is be optimistic and proactive. Uh, and so you, I think you've heard me kind of touch on that. So, mm-hmm. uh, address challenges at the lowest level possible, top, top down solutions. Uh, I've tried to put in place some top down solutions before mm-hmm. they don't always work out the way you think they no. will, Mm-mm. but don't have buy-in. Of, yeah. A lot of good, a lot of good solutions come from the bottom. And, and if nothing else, always try to help have a way to make those kind of things grow uh, and take root. Uh, take administrative and logistics functions uh, to heart or seriously, because to me, they're always about people. That's how mm-hmm. you're taking care of people mm-hmm. inside of any organization. That's a people thing. Uh, be willing to look and think and look at things differently. I think the ability to kind of step outside yourself as a leader and be able to look and go, Hey, is, am I looking at this, am I looking at this the right way? And if you're not able to do it, get some people around you who are yep. able to do that. But the final point, and to me, this is the most important point for a leader. It's, I'm not, I'm not perfect and I don't expect you to be perfect, but I expect a lot of myself and I expect a lot of you. Um, I'll talk about, I'll talk about that a lot on our next show. I love that. Because none of us are perfect in life. No. So so get over it, right? Yeah. We're not perfect. (laughs) We never will be. Yeah. You're not going to do everything right. And, then, right. and neither are your people. You know, your people right. are going to make mistakes. Some of those mistakes you, you can't look the other way on. Mm-hmm. But but some you can grow from. 
and help people grow. And then, Strive for excellence. Perfection is elusive. Yeah. And then, you know, expect a lot of yourself and expect a lot of your people, of those that work for you. I mm -hmm. think that sets the great, it sets a really good attitude because if they see that you expect a lot of yourself or a lot of out of yourself, you know, leaders, I mean, I, I can't tell you I've ever read the book Servant Leadership, but boy, I've got a mentor that that I got to witness it mm -hmm. every day. And I luckily commanded under him multiple times, but he was a true servant leader. And you yeah. know what? He retired from the military and he became the city manager of Panama City, Florida on a Monday and on Thursday, the big hurricane hit. Mm. And now he's the superintendent of schools for that county. And it's because he serves, he served every day of his life. And what a great example, but he expects yeah. a lot of himself. And believe me, having worked for him, he always expected a lot of those that worked for him. And, and, and by the way, every organization he ever led was a really, really good organization. Well, it starts, uh, it starts with yeah. developing the culture and that comes from the leader and it's gotta be somebody who is leading with a servant heart. And that's what's, that's, what's going to get you moving in the right direction. I'm looking yeah. forward to the next, uh, next episode. We're going to have great discussion just as we did in this episode. Thank you so much for. Joining us, uh, Mr. Daryl Guthrie, two-star general. And uh, <laughs> how do people have uh, retired? How do people learn more about you when they want you to do some public speaking and, and learn a little bit more from you? How do they get in touch with you? Uh, you can, you can merely, uh, you can email me. Uh, and my, uh, my, I'll, my email address is, uh, kind of easy i guess it's just d g u t h r i e 342 uh, at gmail.com or you can reach me on linkedin just put in daryl guthrie there's two of us that'll come up go for the older guy the, young, <laughs> the younger guy's my my uh, son okay. <laughs> i think we're the i'm sure there might be some other daryl guthrie's uh, there but uh, the daryl guthrie the leader one. leadership and uh military background so yeah, he's, the, yeah. he's the one on linkedin you want yeah. very good thank you again for being here and listeners thank you for tuning in and taking your time listening to game changers today was a great episode we learned a lot a lot of great nuggets were dropped by mr daryl guthrie and we look forward to the next episode when we're going to talk about Daryl's five points of leadership. Today was a great day, and tomorrow will be even better. Peace, everyone.